Welcome to this session of the Plant Pure Summit 2016, co-sponsored by PlantPureFoods.com. Our guest is Linda Carney, MD. Dr. Carney has been practicing medicine since 1986, completing her residency in emergency medicine at Loma Linda University Medical Centers. After spending years working as an emergency physician, Dr. Carney realized she would rather be like a fence of protection at the top of the cliff instead of like an ambulance at the bottom of a cliff. Through her practice, all med physicians, Dr. Carney now emphasizes the prevention and reversal of disease through lifestyle medicine and health education. It's great to have you at the summit, Dr. Carney. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. It's, it's very um, wonderful to be interviewed by you. <laughs> That's very nice of you to say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so w when and why did you decide to become a doctor? Well, actually, that's kind of a funny story. Um, at age 14, while I was working in the hospital distributing the mail, I peeked into the autopsy suite, and amazingly enough, I got invited in by the pathologist to watch the autopsy, and I found it fascinating and thrilling, and I decided I had to do something in the medical field ever after that. And uh, so... Then I started college as a physical therapy major because I, I loved athletics. Uh, I was a high school gymnast. And, but then at the end of my freshman year, I got a crush on a red-haired boy who said, hey, Linda, why don't you take classes with me and, and go pre-med and, 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 and we can spend more time together. And that sounded pretty good to me. And so actually, I, I prayed about it and I asked God to close every door if, if it wasn't to be, and, uh, and here I am. So I, I'm feeling very grateful for the opportunity to become a physician. Uh, I got a comment that it's, it, I, I wouldn't think every 14-year-old girl who, who got invited in to see an autopsy would be fascinated by it. <laughs> did did yeah. you think that was a little strange? Or, or, you, you know what? You know what, I, my, my mother is a nurse, and uh, my first job was at a hospital, and I just wanted to see all that there was to see, and, and I really found it uh, very interesting. So, uh, you know, I guess that's weird, but I, I just had that scientific curiosity, I guess, sort of born with that. Well, there you go. It, it, I'm sure it, it made you a better doctor. Uh, so when did, why, why did you originally choose emergency medicine? Well... I really, I wanted to be there in people's hour of need. Emotions run really high in the emergency department and uh, people are scared and they need somebody compassionate and somebody who's a person of action and who wants to really get in there and, and do something. And emergency physicians do a lot of procedures. They work with their hands and, and I loved um, taking foreign bodies out of little noses and, and pulling dislocated shoulders back into place. I, I loved it all. So how long did you practice emergency medicine and, and uh, you, did you find it, you must have found it personally satisfying, yes? I did. I, I liked it very much. I, uh, I finished medicine in 86, residency in 89, and then I practiced the emergency medicine until um, <laughs> the, the family doctors in my community where I was practicing emergency medicine invited me into their practices to take take their patients on their day off. And so I was sort of moonlighting in family practice offices and I found it very satisfying. And I found it met a need that I, that I wasn't able to meet in the emergency department and that was prevention and relationships and teaching because the teaching is understandably very limited in an emergency department because it's a time pressured thing. But um, I, I found that I loved primary care, loved it. So when did you, uh, and when and when, when and why did you first become interested in uh, uh, plant-based nutrition? Well, uh, when I was nine years old, I got a, uh, I acquired a stepdad in my life. And his name, you're not going to believe it, was Mr. Mom. And that was before the movie came out. But Mr. Mom was a vegetarian chef in restaurants. And he knew how to cook vegetarian food in the most delicious way. He was a vegetarian. So I'm an impressionable nine-year-old. The food tasted good. I became a vegetarian. And then uh, 20 years ago, when I was 36 years old, uh, I met Dr. Hans Deal and his CHIP program, Complete Health Improvement Project. And Dr. Deal was very inspiring. He came to my town. I volunteered to help with his program. And 
I, I, I realized that that was science I could not outrun. And so I had to change my views and give up all plant, um, all animal foods and become completely plant-based and, and give up the oils because he taught me some science that I had never encountered in medical school. So when and why did you decide to leave emergency medicine? And was that a difficult choice for you? You mean, was it difficult? to stop working night shifts and weekends <laughs> and holidays? <laughs> well, um, you know, the, the difficult part about it was financial because it was a, basically it was a 75% pay cut. And yet I sort, of, I sort of went out on a limb and did it because of the book, The China Study. I, I left the practice of emergency medicine in 2005 because that was the year that I read The China Study. And I had been working at uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and we decided to move to Texas so that I could open my own practice and offer something better than just ill, pill, and bill. I wanted to offer some plant-based hope to people who didn't want to need medications anymore. So when, when you left the emergency medicine, why did you decide to uh, specialize in preventative care? Because... If you prevent a stroke, it is, it's not very glamorous, but it's just so much better. It's better for the patient, obviously, their family, the economy. And, you know, healthcare is a big, big expense in our, in our government's budget. Um, we spend so much of our gross domestic product on healthcare, and the, the nation is not getting healthier. And I wanted to do something about that. Uh, so uh, uh, define the term lifestyle medicine for me. I think that lifestyle medicine is searching for the root cause of the disease. Because when, you, when you're hitting yourself with a hammer by what you eat and drink, by the, by the lifestyle habits that you have, if you can learn, if someone can convince you that what you're doing is like hitting yourself with a hammer, you can stop hitting yourself with a hammer. You can you can heal in so much better ways and even better ways than you had envisioned for yourself. You can have benefits that you weren't even striving for. Uh, just like, um, you know, uh, plant-based diets fix more than one disease. They, they fix a lot of diseases. So in your mind, does uh, plant-based nutrition play a central role then in lifestyle medicine? Oh, absolutely. I would say it's 80%. It is not possible to out-exercise a bad diet. And um, it, it's, it's difficult because many people don't realize how bad their diet is because they think they're doing fine. So is there, uh, why is there a health crisis in America, do you think? I think it's because almost every. Everybody says to me, doctor, I eat healthy, and, uh, and most people think that, that what they're doing is okay if they're slender, or if at the moment they have no symptoms, uh, or if they're biomarkers, you know, their, their blood pressure or their um, blood pressure, uh, blood, um, blood test results, if, they, if they're okay. And yet, what they don't realize is that there are things just around the river bend where you can't see it could be happening because the damage is being done silently. And less than 2% of the population meets American Heart Association guidelines for what a healthy diet is. And those guidelines are not stringent. But those guidelines are, are actually pretty lenient. And yet, less than 2% of Americans meet those requirements. And 98% of Americans think that they're eating just fine, that, that they're eating a healthy diet. Wow, that's a huge gap. Uh, so do you believe a greater emphasis uh, on lifestyle medicine is a key to solving our healthcare crisis? I definitely do, because Medicare's budget, what is it, 45% of it is cardiovascular disease, and Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. MD describes it as a toothless paper tiger that need never, ever exist. Uh, heart disease is reversible. We, we have seen that. I, I've seen that in my practice, and I I'm thrilled to be able to be a part of that with people. That makes up for the lack of financial reward. It is so much more fulfilling that I know that 
I feel called to do this, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be part of so many success stories. That's great. I'm going to ask you about some of it in a minute, but what is All Med Physicians, and when and why did you decide to start it? All Med Physicians is uh, me practicing uh, solo general practice, and, and um, I am practicing with all the medications at my disposal, and my favorite medicine is food. And some of my other, if you can call them medicines or treatments, are you know, fresh air, uh, the proper amount of sunshine, uh, adequate sleep, exercise, uh, proper use of water, uh, clean, um, good social interrelationships, um, trust in God's love. All of these things can help various aspects of disease. And so that's what the all of all med physicians is, uh, definitely more than simply medicines that mask symptoms. So what sort of patients do you usually see and what range of ailments do you, do you typically get? I see uh, patients age two and up. And so I have children and uh, teenagers and young adults and older adults. And uh, basically anything that, that walks in the door, I will be there for it if I can. And so there are people with back pain who don't realize that back pain is a circulation issue. And there are people with heavy monthly bleeding who are headed straight towards a hysterectomy and they don't understand how foods and beverages are pushing them towards that unnecessary hysterectomy. And uh, there are people with skin issues. There are, there are people with um, white spots on their face, a like Go. And they've been told that really there is no cure for that and, and there isn't anything they can do. And, and yet, if you look on my uh, website, one of my four websites, uh, drcarney.com, you'll see some before and after pictures of people who are reversing things that aren't written up to be reversible when you look in the medical textbooks. So uh, what role does then plant-based nutrition play in the way you treat your patients? I, it seems like it's very central to me. Is that true? It, it, it very much is. And uh, what I do is I help people where they're at. They're, they're coming in with a chief complaint, we call it in medicine. They're, they're coming in with a, a symptom that they want to talk about, whether it's weight or, or prediabetes or their high blood pressure. Sometimes they're coming in and they just they write on their sign-in sheet, refills. And, um, and, and what they don't realize is how their lifestyle habits, specifically their food, are contributing to the need for that refill. And if I can help them by sharing the science with them and just planting seeds for people and help them to realize um, how food can make them not need that medication. Because you see, the people that come into my practice, many of them are just finding me on uh, their insurance website. They're coming in and they just want a doctor close to their neighborhood. I live in a small town. I'm the only doctor for adults in my town. And so they just want somebody local. And they just, they're coming in for a refill. And they have no idea that they're about to meet someone who is offering them something better than ill, pill, and bill. They're, they're about to find out how these kinds of animal product foods can be making their blood pressure worse or raising their cholesterol higher or making them diabetic. And they've never been taught that. They, they've been taught by their traditional doctors that it's their genetics and that they're a hopeless pawn in this game. And so I like to put the power in their hands. I like to um, help women see the eight different factors that can cause excess estrogen and lead to um, hot flashes or, depending on their age, uh, infertility or, or menstrual cramps all these kinds of things. So my job is to tell them stories of hope about how this symptom that they've come in with can be helped if they'll do this. And here is the science that, that gives them the proof of that. So how receptive are most of your patients when you suggest uh, that they try plant-based nutrition? Ah, that's, that's a $64 million question. Um, some people are very, very surprised. Some people are very hostile. They, they don't want it. And you can, um, you can sense, you know, when the, when the message is not going over well. And so, you know, I pull back and, and I let them know, I'm not here to tell you what to eat. You get to eat whatever you want. 
I'm here to tell you that what you eat may have these consequences because I've seen it over and over. And if, if you change to this style of eating, this whole foods, unprocessed, low-fat, plant-based way of eating, your symptoms may go away. But I will offer you the medication if that's what you prefer. And and everybody's different, and I don't I don't force it. Of course, I want everyone to eat more fruits and vegetables, but what they eat is their business. And so whether they are a telephone consult, people who can't afford to come here in person, or, or people who are just looking to, you know, find a doctor who takes their insurance, which you know, I'm trying to make this accessible to everybody. Um, I find that there's a wide range. But one of the most interesting things is that <laughs> people that seem pretty closed-minded at the beginning of the interview, then they, they, they go away, they get their blood drawn fasting, and then they come back and we talk over their blood work. And then they tell me things like, well, I haven't eaten any meat since I met you. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you know what I have written here in the margin of my, of my notes? Uh, well, yeah, doctor, you probably have, um, I like my meat. Yes, that's exactly what I have written. Um, what made you decide? And then I asked the patient, what made you, you decide to give up the meat? And they says, well, you know, I checked out some of the um, science on drcarney.com. I, I clicked on some of the links. I read some of those things. And I found the science very credible. And so I decided, well, you know, I can give it a try. I'm not, I'm not going to die with, you know, with, without meat for a month. And, and so they give it a try. And then they feel so much better that that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. That gives them the momentum to, um, to keep going. I, I remember one patient specifically, you know, she, she was suffering. And, and, and when she came in to me, I told her about setting aside these things, you know, the meat, dairy, the eggs, oil, and, and, and putting this into her life. And in two weeks, she came and she was like literally dancing circles around me. She was like, woohoo, doctor, I've kicked it. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not hurting anymore. And she was, she was so happy. And uh, that's why I love doing what I do. <laughs> that has got to be tremendously satisfying for a, a physician. Uh, I was going to ask you if, if you hit that initial skepticism with people, do, do you, are there any methods you use to try and convince them? Uh, or do you just sort of let it alone? You know, um, it's after after practicing medicine for thirty years, you need to to see where the person is coming from. And if the walls are coming up, and and if they don't want to hear it, you have to back off and and be respectful of them because this is a very unique message. And when they come in, some of them are so innocent. When, we, when they call us for an initial appointment, we ask them, have you watched Forks Over Knives? No, they say, what's that? And, and, and we say, do you have Netflix? It's on Netflix. And, um, and so, you know, that's kind of the primer. Right? We're priming the pump there. And so they're kind of realizing, and would you like to go and see drcarney.com? Look at the website before you come in for your first appointment. So not all of them are coming in cold turkey, but some of them are. And, and, and I just have to be very respectful and so what I do is there are some people who say to me I don't want to talk about food and I say okay I respect you I won't talk about food and what happens is when the symptom you know comes up the next time they're, they're in for sinus infection or they're in for a sore throat I'll say I remember that you asked me not to talk about food and so here are the prescriptions that I would recommend to help you get over your cough and the yellow stuff coming out your nose and if you would like to know what foods are going to relieve your suffering, you just ask me. Here I am for you. If you don't want to know it, just let me know, and I, I won't say a thing. What, what's your preference? You know, you name a system of the body, Lee, and, and we have the science to tell you how the animal proteins hurt it, how the oil is hurting it. Uh, and having that kind of science makes practicing this method of, of medical care very, very satisfying because you know that this is not testimonials. This is science. Yeah, you really there is there really is a lot of science behind this now. I mean, it's it almost seems to me like uh, you know the scientific case has already been made. It, 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 so it's sort of shocking to me or amazing to me that so many people and so many physicians, for instance, are still have their mind closed to this. Uh, why, why do you think that is? When, when the pleasure center is hit by foods high in fat 
and um, an animal protein. You know, we, we burst out into our circulation all these neurotransmitters, these feel-good chemicals, the dopamine, the serotonin, the, the endorphins. And so here we are raised above baseline temporarily, and, and the, the brain interprets that as delicious. It doesn't realize it's getting intoxicated on it because you know it's not the same as the intoxication from cocaine or, or alcohol, although that it's it's really the same mechanism, just kind of a different degree. And but as time goes on, because we can't use all those feel-good chemicals at once, they're frittered away. And so then as time goes on, we're below baseline and we um, are depleted of our feel-good chemicals and we don't even feel normal and we'll do anything to feel normal. And so we realized that yesterday, eating the frosting out of the can made us feel better uh, temporarily, or, or eating the chicken sandwich made us feel better. And so, so we'll do anything to get back up to baseline, and that's the basis of addiction. And these foods with high fat, with animal protein, with, with refined sugar, with salt, they are addicting, as uh, Doug Lyle so aptly describes in the book, The Pleasure Trap. And so people, people are trapped because they're so busy, they feel like it's too much much of a barrier to learn how to cook plant-based foods. They feel like they don't have the time. And that's when I try, as, as a real-life person who works way too many hours a week, I'm ashamed of you know, working more than 60 hours a week, but that's just my life. And, but I'm the primary cook in the family, and I, t I tell them how I do it. And my patients who travel for a living, and they're like, what do I eat you know, in a hotel room? Or what do I eat when I'm on a business dinner with clients? What do I eat in the restaurant? And so I tell them what I do when I'm speaking um, in the U.S. or Canada and I'm living out of a hotel room and I, and I show them this is what I do. And, and if I have a fridge and a microwave in the room, I'm eating like a king. It's, it's great, but I show them how it's doable with very little time and, and give them some tricks. Um, Lee, I believe there are three things that people need to know to succeed in a plant-based life. Number one, they need to know the science. Um, what is it that I need to do and why? They really need to know why. And then number two, okay, how? How do I do this practically? How do I make it work as a, as a busy single mom or as a, uh, a college student or, or as um, a retired person on a fixed income? And then number three is the psychology of it. How to stick with it when the going is hard? Because, you know, our taste buds are accustomed to something. I grew up eat, uh, hating beans and vegetables. I did not want to eat them. I was, you know, a grilled cheese sandwich person. I was a macaroni and cheese person. I, I had to have cheese at every meal. And my taste buds changed. And so I tell them through my own experience that if they'll hang with it, their taste buds will change. 30 days and the taste buds will be tasting different. And the foods that were too bland, boring, and bitter will start tasting differently. And after 90 days, you can overcome that high fat addiction. And after six months, the food starts tasting really good. And after a year, you feel so much better, you'll never go back because you don't want to feel icky. And almost every single one of my patients, you know, tells me that they have this, they have this backsliding period or this fall off the wagon period where, you know, they eat something yucky. They eat something that they, that they formerly thought was good and they felt yucky. And so they realize, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> they don't do that anymore. <laughs> That's a good way to learn the lesson, really. I mean, it's like stepping on the third rail, you know. It's uh, you, yes. you don't want to step there. So uh, do you find attitude of your colleagues changing towards plant-based nutrition, uh, other MDs that you know or uh, come, come across? <laughs> yes, I do. And, um, at, in the, you know, I've been doing this now in Texas for uh, – 10 years, and, and at first, you know, it, was, it took a lot of backbone to do this. This is before Forks Over Knives came out. It was before these ideas started gaining the traction that we have, and thank you to you for giving us some of that traction. But um, um, people are, they, they won't like admit it overtly, you know, but, but they're doing it, and, and I can see some of my colleagues doing it and saying, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I'm plant-based now. I was like, you are? Well, that's great. You know, and then we talk about it. And, and so, you know, they're pretty quiet about it. Um, and, uh, and then there are some people who are suffering enough that they've reached their teachable moment. 
And that teachable moment um, comes at a different place for every person because I think the people who have suffered enough to, to try something different, they, they get greater benefits and it pulls them into staying with it because they're feeling so much better. They're reversing their disease. And, and I'm talking about my physician colleagues. And, uh, and also uh, one way to win them over is with delicious food. And so at every opportunity that I can get, I am trying to cook for my colleagues. When, when they come to visit me, I am saying, hey, stay for lunch. Yeah, we have plenty of food. Or, or, or stay for, for dinner. And as, as often as I can, I like to prepare food for people because I, I think that if they can just realize, hey, I don't have to give up taste. This food is delicious. I really, I, I can have it all. I can have food that I love and, uh, and better health. And, and that's what happened for me personally when uh, I became completely plant-based um, I had far less asthma and allergies, but when I met Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. MD in person, when I met T. Caldwell Gamble in person, when I met Rip Esselstyn, who hired me uh, for the, as the medical director for his emergence, that's when I gave up oil, and that's when I became free of asthma. And, and it was wonderful to no longer need that inhaler. I've been asthmatic since child, childhood, and, uh, and, and so this happening for me, for, for uh, my colleagues, and uh, and they don't, you know, they don't say a lot about it, but, you know, I, I see these changes in their lives as, as we associate uh, socially, and uh, it's, it's nice. It, it's really nice. I, I think that's a very charmingly sneaky way of you to do it, too, to invite them to stay for dinner. And, <laughs> yes, the, and, the hardest to the stomach. <laughs> and then cook them something really good, and then tell them, oh, yes. it's plant-based. And then, are they surprised, everyone, when uh, you tell them it was plant-based? Um, because I have this reputation, they pretty much know that it's going to be five minutes. So I, I sort of lost that element of surprise. But um, one, one, one area that I do have the element of surprise is when I hire new employees. And I like to hire young people who are trying to get into medical school and who are trying to get into physician's assistant school, nurse practitioner school. And um, so when I hire them, most of them are not vegan. They're, they're not plant-based and they're just they're regular people with four-year college degrees. And then, then they start seeing these success stories with the patients and they see the patients losing weight and getting off the blood pressure medicine. They see diabetes reversed. They see um, the low amount of strokes and heart attacks in my practice over the years. Like I think two strokes in 10 years, uh, three heart attacks in 10 years. And, and, and so they're seeing this and so one by one, the employees are becoming more plant-based. We hold potlucks to celebrate birthdays and holidays and things like that. And so then they, and they enjoy trying to learn how to make these things. And, and we all share. And of course, I, you know, I make as many things as I think I can, you know, get them to eat. And, and you know, some things they like, some things not so much. But uh, my, my employees are being moved. And I love, I love touching the future of healthcare by launching these people because they don't stay with me that long with within one to two years they're usually successfully getting into med school getting into nurse practitioner school and so now there's a slew of them who have you know left my employee and they're they're working their way through medical school and um that's a very satisfying thing about uh operating my own practice and being able to hire people and influence in life uh that's great it's like planting seeds like your johnny apple seed in a way or something like that right <laughs> Yes, yes, and touching their future families because when they have children, those children are going to be healthier because of what mom or dad learned in my practice. Speaking of family, what about your family? And uh, you have you have kids also, and I have a stepdaughter, and um, I have a wonderful husband. My husband is a he's my practice administrator. He, he's an expert in IT. He's the one who has created the four websites for me. That veggieboard.com, uh, startsmart.com, uh, all my physicians practice website, and, and he helped me to make the DVDs um, on different topics, you know, the best blood pressure plan and how to reverse diabetes. And so uh, this, this practice would not be possible without my wonderful husband, Sean Carney. And uh, how old is your stepdaughter? 35. Okay. <laughs> is she plant-based? Um, she won't admit it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh dear. I love my daughter. I would, I, I do not want to offend my daughter in any way. Um, my daughter eats very, very healthily. I don't think that she would say I identify as a vegan. I don't think she would say that. Okay. Well, we'll allow her that. I mean, I can understand that. Uh, yeah. But uh, so do you have any other great patient turnaround stories that you could share with us? Oh, yes. Um, uh, let me talk again about the vitiligo. Her name is uh, Preci, and Preci is on my website, and Preci is a Latina, and she had white spots on her face, and she's a musical performer. She's a very gifted singer. And when she adopted a completely plant-based diet and she got rid of the meat, dairy, eggs, oil, and then she saw the vitiligo going away, it was a wonderful moment for both of us. And you can see her before and after pictures on my website. And there's another patient in my practice who I haven't had a chance to you know, photograph him and, and get his success story up. But he also, he, he is a person of darker skin and he is filling in uh, and he's, uh, I haven't known him as long as I've known Preci, but uh, he's on his way to an even skin tone. And that is very gratifying. And then um, one, of the, one of the happiest stories I have is uh, Mike Crockett who runs Bonebreaker Barbell, a vegan gym in Austin. And Mike Crockett is a wonderful success story. Mike um, topped out at 571 pounds. So he was a big boy. And um, when we met, um, he was uh, convinced of the scientific evidence behind the plant-based diet. And then within 18 months, he was down below 420. And Mike's never going to be twiggy. Uh, he, he's always going to be very, very big. I mean, he's, he's, he's so hugely strong. He can like pick up a Volkswagen and, you know, he's just, he's amazing. And, uh, and, and, and yet I'm just very happy to not only have been uh, an encouragement to Mike, but also now he, he's turning around and at his gym, his clients come, he turns them plant-based. So everybody's paying it forward and, and, and that's really exciting. Uh, Allie lost her back pain, uh, brought her cholesterol down. Susie uh, reversed her Crohn's disease so that uh, she has far less suffering than she has had before. Um, there are many patients in my practice who have avoided hysterectomies. They were headed straight towards hysterectomies. And by learning the eight factors that uh, uh, lower estrogen, um, you know, she, she learned what to do and she reversed her problems in time and didn't need to have a hysterectomy. And, and I love that. I think women are so busy in today's world and they're taking care of everybody and they don't feel like they have time to take care of themselves. And women are, are big purveyors, big consumers of healthcare. And uh, if, if we can help the wife, the mother know how to cook, we can reach the whole family and we can, we can improve the health of the whole family. So I have a special burden on my heart for helping women to see uh, how they can keep their skin as good as possible for as long as possible, how they can be in normal weight, how they can have more energy. Uh, almost every woman who comes into my practice is um, asking, how do I get more energy? And, uh, and it's a pleasure to see them becoming more energetic as they adopt a plant-based diet. Well, it's clear that you have a lot of energy and you look great. So uh, it seems to be working with you. Uh, so I take it you're satisfied with your plant-based diet. And oh, yes. I love my food. I, um, when there's beets for breakfast, I'm really happy. And I would never eat a beet before. I mean, I, I don't think I ever ate a beet prior to, to, you know, well, certainly not before I was age 36. I just, you know, but... I, I love beans. Honestly, beans are my antidepressant. I eat them at breakfast because they have such great resistant starch that they keep me satisfied for a long time and I don't get hungry. And yes, I, I, I do spend a lot of energy, you know, in the way I live life. And uh, if, if I eat beans and vegetables for breakfast, that's just how I choose to do it because I feel um, more energy doing that. And so I eat a really big breakfast and a really tiny supper. And that just works for me. And it works for a lot of my patients. And so I, I find that um, when I read Dr. Esselstyn's wonderful book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, the thing that struck me going through all of his recipes was, wow, beans, 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 beans. And so that's what got me eating beans at two different meals a day and, uh, or lentils or split peas. 
and and I find them um, uh, a, a big factor in lowering my own cholesterol. Because when I was 22 years old and I started medical school, my cholesterol was 225, and I was a vegetarian. But I was an olive oil swilling, Frito eating, cheese munching vegetarian, you know, pretty typical. And uh, now, you know, most people their cholesterol goes up as as they age. But now my cholesterol is below 150 for the first time in my life. Now that's not easy for me. I, I have those genetic strikes against me, but. You have to work at that, but uh, it's it's wonderful to to have a total cholesterol below 150. Finally, well, I, uh, it is great. I think one uh, uh, one big misconception people have about a plant based diet is that it's a diet of deprivation, no. but it clearly is not. Uh, right. Provide some insight into that. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, beans and corn and things like that. These are very hearty filling things, and it's not like you're eating lettuce all the time or nibbling on broccoli. Absolutely. And let me just show you a picture, if I may, um, about um, if, I can, if I can bring up three, I don't know if you can see this, but I, I have four stomachs here, and one stomach is full. And, and that stomach is full because of fiber and water in the unprocessed whole plant-based foods. And each of these stomachs has a differing volume of food, but the same amount of calories. And so over here, you can see a tiny amount of food then that's oil. And the most fattening food in the world is vegan, oils. Oils have 4,000 calories per pound of food, but they don't stretch out the stretch receptors in the stomach. Whereas the lower calorie concentration foods, the foods that are not as concentrated in calories, um, they're filling up the stomach, stretching out the stretch receptors, and, and leaving you satisfied. And so if you eat for calorie concentration, you can fill up, feel satisfied, and love your food. Plus, the... Um, the taste buds can change, and the less you eat the, the high fat and, and the high sugar and the animal protein, the less you crave it, and that's the good news. Your taste buds can change. It seems to me that uh, that, that uh, diagram you just held up, I think we had something similar to that in Forks Over Knives, uh, so it, it's very familiar. I, uh, uh, but, yeah, it's really, it's really – uh, uh, telling, I think, uh, about the stretch receptors and how you feel satisfied and, and uh, the, the fact that oil is so calorie dense, but it doesn't fill your stomach at all. So you still can feel hungry, and, but have, you know, just tons of calories in there. Right. And one other thing about oil, um, I don't know if you can see these um, molecules. Let me get a little closer. These molecules are estrogen, cholesterol, testosterone, progesterone, the more, and you can see how similar they look, they have a, a, a chain of carbon rings. And the more we eat um, cholesterol, which is only found in meat, dairy, and eggs, the more we eat uh, oil, the more estrogen we make inside ourselves. This is uh, brought out in Dr. T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study. And all of that estrogen suppresses testosterone in a man. And if a man understood that every time he eats a bite of chicken, or, or an egg, he is suppressing his testosterone and over estrogenizing himself because men have estrogen, they have smaller amounts than women, of course, but um, and, and women are suppressing their progesterone, which is leading to heavy monthly bleeding. And I think if we can help people understand how they can rebalance their hormones and, and live the most fulfilling lives in many different aspects of life. Uh, that gives them a lot of hope and a, and a lot of power to say, you know what, I can, I can tough it out until my taste buds change. I, I can get used to this. And it's really a matter of getting used to it. And, of course, the foods can be made delicious. You don't have to uh, avoid seasonings. You can season it up, and it, it can be great tasting. Uh, totally. It is, it, it is great tasting, actually. I mean, it, uh, really it is. Uh, and that's something I, that it's, uh, I think a lot of people find a revelation. Uh, yes. That, you know, that uh, plant-based nu nutrition, plant-based meals are not dull and every day, you know, it's, it's, you can mix it up. It's, there's a tremendous variety of different foods that you can eat to satisfy a plant-based diet and, uh, and, Absolutely. and get, get really good sources of nutrition from lots and lots of different places. And one of the things that I would like to mention is, um, although I try to cook with a minimum of salt, there is a salt called kala namak, K-A-L-A, 
N-A-M-A-K, and Konamak is called Black Himalayan, and it's actually pink in color, but they call it black, and it smells really bad. It smells like rotten eggs. But this salt, when you put it with tofu and you make it like into a quiche or a frittata, it makes tofu taste like eggs because of that sulfurous smell. And that is the secret to um, winning people's taste buds. And there is a different way that I prepare food when people are used to chicken fried steak and, you know, Ben and Jerry's ice cream and and this kind of thing, I, I cook a little differently, you know, a little higher in fat, a little higher in salt uh, for them, but it helps them to understand, oh, I can do this. I can, I can love the food. In fact, I want to tell you something about Mike and his um, success story. When we asked um, Mike in to eat lunch with us, it, it was the first day of, of being our patient, and we said, we want you to eat lunch with us uh, for three days in a row at, when you come for your doctor's appointments. And so... Um, before he came in for lunch, I was fixing him a plate and my husband said, well, you know, he's a grown man. He can fix his own plate. And I said, no, wait, I'm, I'm trying to do something. So I was heaping this plate high. And when Mike came in and I, and I served him his plate, his eyes got big and he said, I can eat all that. And my husband said, no, Mike, you can have seconds. And Mike, you know, a, a little tear, you know, trickled down his cheek and he said, you know what? I think I can do this. And sure enough, he did it. He did it. That's a great story. That's great. Uh, so what, what are your hopes for the future of America's healthcare system? I hope that people will have a friend invite them to a plant-based potluck. The um, Plant Pure Nation movie was so inspiring, and the pods are, are growing everywhere. Our, our um, Plant Pure pod in Austin is called ATX Alive, and we're outgrowing everybody's homes and offices. And so uh, just yesterday, I was um, taking the leaders of the ATX Alive pod um, through my church fellowship hall and saying, hey, the church has donated this space to you if you would like to have your monthly potlucks here. And they said, yes, we love it. It's got a kitchen. It's got a room. It's air conditioned. It's great. And what I want is I want people to have their friends cook for them. I want people to have their friends love them into this lifestyle change by, you know, winning their taste buds, by, by appealing to their minds with science and rationality. Because if you go on this journey with a friend, it's a lot easier. And that's what I'm striving to be for my patients. And I really think that um, Plant Pure Nation has it right. They, they want to start a grassroots movement. They, they want this to go out into communities from the ground up. Because if we wait for government to do this, we're going to wait a long time because uh, the food industry has big bucks and they have legislators in their pockets. I mean, that's what the, I mean, the movie Plant Pure Nation just brings that out. And so if we reach the hearts of the people through their taste buds, if we reach their minds, uh, we, can, we can mingle with them as somebody who wants to do them good. We can meet their needs, win their confidence, and say, why don't you try and, and follow what I'm doing? Well, clearly uh, you're a big part of what's happening. So uh, I thank you for your efforts and uh, I thank you for taking the time to be part of the summit. Uh, uh, and for your time for being interviewed. Uh, it was great. And uh, uh, is there a website? Uh, you said uh, uh, a number of websites, any number of websites that you can uh, uh, guide people to. I, I don't know if you can see this, but it's um, veggievore.com. And veggievore.com has my DVD on it. And there's a free giveaway uh, on, on the Facebook site, um, uh, we're going to be answering questions after this. I, I uh, hope people will click on the plantpeersummit.com link for the free giveaway so that they can come and see. But if you would just like to uh, watch the free trailers at veggievore.com, V-E-G-G-I-E-V-O-R-E, -G -G -E -E, like carnivore, but veggievore. That's great. And for everybody else out there who wants to know what we're doing to help create a uh, plant pure nation, visit us at our website, which is plantpurenation.com. Thanks again, doctor, you. for your time. You're welcome. Thank you.